Our goal is to do two or three quick educational videos a month. They can serve as a good educational refresher or quickly clarify some misconceptions. This week is the difference between internal and external shoulder impingement. We're going to address the anatomy, clinical diagnosis, and quickly touch on the differences between the treatments. These videos will also serve to be a good gateway to start discussion. I'm Nick Conti. If you like this video, go to nextwavept.com. Be a part of our site. Submit any educational pieces that you have made, whether it's blog topics like case studies or article reviews, videos, links, PDF resources, or just comments or questions about the site or health-related topics. Impingement is very generic and an overly used term. The difference between internal and external impingement really comes down to which side of the rotator cup and capsule we're talking about. Top side would be an external impingement because it's external to the capsule, also known as outlet impingement or subacromial impingement. Internal impingement involves the underside of the rotator cuff and involves the capsule, proximal insertion of the biceps tendon at times, and the labrum itself. External impingement is more common, tends to be more symptomatic, whereas internal impingement is commonly found in asymptomatic at throwing athletes via MRI. External impingement tends to be an easier concept and much more diagnosed pathology than internal impingement. With abduction, the greater tubercle of the humerus, as well as humeral head, generally migrates superiorly. This is increased with imbalances in the rotator cuff, specifically with the supraspidatus. As the humeral head migrates superiorly, the already small subacromial space narrows. This narrowing is normal, but we want to limit the narrowing as much as possible to reduce the stress on the supraspinatus that passes in the space, as well as the subacromial bursa under the chromium process that tends to get inflamed. Certain hooked acromial shapes predispose us to these issues, as well as osteophytes that cause narrowing of the space. When the bursa or supraspinatus become inflamed, this exacerbates the problem by narrowing the space through the inflammation and edema and makes the normal process now a painful one. This patient will present with anterior or superior shoulder pain. In the throwing athlete, pain is usually noticed during the cocking phase when the shoulder is fully abducted and externally rotated, closing the subacromial space. Pain may also be felt with the follow-through due to the eccentric force that the supraspinatus must generate to decelerate the arm in throwing. These patients tend to follow certain patterns. You may notice the dreaded forward head posture, anterior tilted, upperly rotated, abducted scapula with decreased thoracic mobility. While observing the scapula dynamically, you may also notice early and excessive motion due to lack of stability control uh, and poor motor planning. All these have been shown to decrease the subacromial space, possibly predisposing these patients to this pathology. This patient may present with a painful arc sign with pain only in mid-range of abduction due to the superior migration of the greater tubercle and the dynamics of the rotator cuff and deltoid force coupling if weakness or imbalance is present. Special tests commonly used to implement external impingement include cross-arm adduction, yokum, and the NEARS test. The most sensitive test being the Hawkins-Kennedy test, and the most specific being the empty can test. You can refer to my post on shoulder special tests for more information. After treating the acute stage with your price principles, modalities, possibly NSAIDs for pain and inflammation, we need to address the imbalances that we noted during our evaluation process. These could be things such as tight anterior chest wall musculature, poor motor planning causing forward shoulder, uh, shoulder posture, decreased thoracic mobility, uh, especially with extension, or a weak rotator cuff. An anteriorly downwardly tilted abducted scapula puts the glenohumeral joint in an unoptimal position for both strength of the rotator cuff and maximizing the subacromial space. A lot of these imbalances that we're noticing, such as the tight anterior chest wall or decreased st strength of the lower traps, is going to put the scapula in, into this uh, unoptimal position. The importance of the rotator cuff strength to stabilize um, and compress the humeral head into the glenoid fossa during elevation of the arm to counter the strong upward pull of the deltoid are vital to maximize the subacromial space as well. Remember, the rotator cuff needs to be trained both concentrically but also eccentrically and dynamically because this is how it's going to be used during the throwing cycle. Start rehabilitation in an unpainful range, most likely at zero degrees of elevation with the arm kind of at the side and work your way up to the throwing position as pain and stabilization strength allows. Uh, dynamic or static rhythmic stabilization is a great way to achieve this objective as your rehab progresses. Internal impingement is also common in a throwing athlete. In external rotation and abduction there can be a pinch or friction of the inferior aspect of the rotator cuff between the humerus and the glenoid causing underside fraying. 
The superior labrum and undersurface of the rotator cuff usually can rub together, which is described as a kissing lesion. Both will be frayed and may be pathological. Some also include the bicep tendon, which comes around as a connection to the superior labrum. Remember, throwing athletes have been shown to have increased external rotation on the throwing side, which can increase susceptibility to this pathology. Although this is a normal variation in a throwing athlete, along with decreased internal rotation, as a throwing athlete fatigues through a season, internal rotation has been shown to decrease and external rotation to increase. It is important as health professionals working with these athletes during the season to maintain their baseline arc of motion. This can be done through stretching and continuous strengthening throughout the season based on the individual athlete's presentation. The presentation of internal impingement is different than external impingement. Pain is more vague with internal impingement, where with external impingement, pain is easier localized by the athlete. Pain is deep in the shoulder, usually during the cocking phase of the throwing cycle, and tends to be more posterior than uh, the external impingement pain, which is more anterior and superior. This pain will also not be palpable, where with external impingement, it is possible that you can palpate the region uh, just inferior to the acromion that uh, could have some tenderness. Special tests that will implement internal impingement include the posterior impingement sign and the internal rotation resisted strength tests. The crank, the clunk, and the jerk tests are also commonly used. Uh, an MRI may be necessary to identify the extent of the anatomical abnormalities, but again, this is common in asymptomatic throwing athletes. So it's vital to connect to the imaging findings with the clinical presentation, or else you'll end up doing some unnecessary surgeries. Scapular position has a lot to do with internal impingement because it can change the relative internal rotation external rotation of the glenohumeral joint and in turn the subacromial space. Downward rotation and abduction of the scapula has been correlated to increased contact between the undersurface of the rotator cuff and the glenoid. External rotation with anterior laxity can, have increased, can increase impingement. Remember, throwing athletes already tend to have increased external rotation. Posterior tightness has been theorized to superiorly and posteriorly migrate the humeral head, reducing the subacromial space, although this is just a theory at this point. Addressing the impairments that are found with will be a very very similar uh, to the treatment of external impingement. However, addressing the posterior shoulder soft tissue tightness, not just the capsular tightness, will be a key. A great way to do this is through cross-arm adduction stretch with stabilization of the scapula, as well as manual pinning of the posterior musculature during stretching uh, to address any specific adhesions. Strengthening the rotator cuff, again, to keep the humeral head from riding up into the glenoid will be vital for this rehabilitation. Getting the acute inflammation to subside and identifying structural abnormalities will be important to plan the course of your rehabilitation. If the fraying of either the rotator cuff or labrum is too extensive, conservative treatment may be unsuccessful and in this case the best course of action will probably be arthroscopic surgery and debridement. Preventing the pathologies in young asymptomatic athletes is our best treatment to avoid further surgical intervention or surgical intervention in the first place. Identifying poor scapular position and control, weak rotator cuffs, posterior shoulder tightness, or anterior laxity in, athletes, in young athletes' careers may reduce the chance of this injury later in their careers. I'm Nick Conti. Thanks for watching this. Hopefully it was helpful. Please continue the conversation by commenting on uh, different parts of our website and submitting any educational pieces or helpful documents that you think the people might enjoy and benefit from. Again, Next Wave PT. Thanks a lot.